Well, hello, everybody, and, and welcome back to the fall series of Investor's Guide to Thriving. Uh, it's, it's been a crazy year, as, as everyone will know uh, at this point. Um, lots of things going on in the world. Uh, lots of great questions came in this week, so we'll, we'll get to those at the end. Um, you know, just by, by way of um, introduction, again, these events are, are done free for all our viewers, BNN. They are sponsored by some of the companies, of course, I'm involved with. Everyone will know ETF Capital Management. Not everyone will know uh, what QWell Partners, uh, but it's really an innovative next generation um, partnership for, for wealth management. Um, and that ETF capital management is actually part of, of Quintessence Wealth, Q Wealth. And then U Potential, which is our, um, say, next generation uh, financial planning um, uh, company as well. Uh, of course, I have here with me today um, Aaron Allen from, from Bank of Montreal. And they, they've been such, such a great educational co-sponsor with us for these events over the years. Um, I'll, I'll bring on Aaron in a minute here, but, but you know, since BMO ETF started going well back over a decade now, they've just been a, a leader in the Canadian marketplace educating investors. And, and I'm just so thrilled to partner with them. All, everyone will know at this point that I, I run an ETF for them. I also run three mutual funds. Um, so by way of full disclosure, they're a partner, but I do um, Q Wealth and ETF Capital Management are involved with Bank of Montreal sub-advising uh, relationships on uh, funds. So, you know, the, the upside of, of what we're trying to do here is raise money for charities. In the decade that we've been doing both the BNN Roadshows and now, since COVID, the virtual road shows, uh, we've raised well over $500,000 for uh, charities. Uh, Baycrest Hospital alone has been in excess of $500,000. I'm not sure what the sick kids number is, but I, I know it's it's several hundred thousand. So, you know, for for kids cancer uh, charities, that that is a very close uh, thing to. Uh, my my very good partner Jared Rabinowitz um, and his family, and, and all of us here at, at Q Wealth and ETF Capital Management, and the Baycrest uh, Hospital for the incredible work they do in dementia and Alzheimer's research. Uh, Bank of Montreal has not only been a great partner for us here on the educational front; they've been a fantastic supporter of our charitable efforts. And with that introduction. Um, you know, about a week and a, and a little bit ago, Aaron and I were on stage for the first time together um, at the Toronto Money Show uh, since COVID. And it was, it, I'll tell you folks, it was a lot of fun to get up in front of a live audience again. Um, you know, we're all kind of used to these virtual webinars and, and things like that. Um, but I'm actually quite thrilled not to get on an airplane ever again, frankly. Um, you know, but but I know that that day will come again. Um, so, Aaron, welcome. Um, I know you have some great thoughts on uh, some simple rules that uh, ETF investors should be aware of. And it's always great to start off our series with uh, a bit of due diligence, if you will. Perfect. Thanks, Larry. Thanks for having me. And yes, it was great to have you as my guest at the Money Show, too, and uh, get the dust off of us a little in terms of our public speaking. Um, so I'm Erin Allen. I'm the VP of Online ETF Distribution at BMO ETFs. So really happy to be kicking off your first show here on the Investor's Guide to Thriving for your fall series. Uh, for the next 15 minutes, as you mentioned, we're going to review some simple rules for becoming a better ETF investor. So I thought this was a good place to start being our first, your first show. So before we do, uh, a quick disclaimer here that we're not providing you any advice or investment recommendations today. Uh, our presentation is all about uh, providing you education and information on ETFs and the markets in order to help you become a, a better, more confident investor. 
and and for me whatever i say is is investment advice but it's not advice specific for any single person out there of course because i i don't know who you are necessarily um, and that's really important learning and part of what I'm going to talk about today. So, Erin, take it away. All right. So if we go to the next slide, um, with over 40 ETF providers now in Canada and over 1,100 ETF products available to you all, um, we can we can see that uh, we do need to have some simple rules for determining the best product for you and for trading these, these great investment vehicles. So you can see in this chart here that Canadians have really adopted ETFs over the past decade. Um, we at BMO, by way of introduction, have about 26% of the ETF market share here in Canada. Uh, we have been number one in net new flows for 11 years in a row, so very proud of that. Uh, and I think that's a testament to our excellent product uh, lineup, uh, a few of which Larry has uh, given us the ideas for. Um, we have the most precise fixed income suite in Canada. Uh, we segment all of our fixed income products by term and credit. Uh, we also are the number one covered call ETF provider in terms of AUM. Uh, and we're one of the first to bring these innovative income solutions to market here in Canada as well. Uh, so those are just a couple of our accolades, but really we have a diverse range of solutions all built for Canadian investors and we are definitely continue to innovate in this space. As I mentioned, we're going to be reviewing um, some of the benefits of ETFs today uh, to get us started and then we'll get into some of the simple rules for ETF investors as well. So let's review what makes ETFs such a great investment vehicle. Number one, they are liquid. Unlike other investment vehicles, if I think about mutual funds or GICs, uh, ETFs provide intraday liquidity, which means you can buy and sell them during trading hours on the stock exchange. So definitely a benefit there in terms of flexibility within your portfolio. Number two, they're diversified. Um, so this can help lower risk in your portfolio, you know, by investing in a basket of stocks or bonds, uh, you reduce that concentration risk or that risk of putting all your eggs in one or two baskets. Um, they're efficient. So ETFs started out as, uh, you know, mostly broad market index based tools, which in and of themselves are very efficient ways to access the market. Um, but over time they've evolved and now they can give you efficient access to some areas of the markets that, you know, do it yourself investors typically weren't able to access in their portfolios. So if I think about emerging market equities, a lot of the different bond segments, you know, covered call strategy, the time and expertise that that would take in a DIY investor, preferred shares, and so much more, giving efficient access to some of these asset classes. Uh, they're cost efficient. So ETFs are generally low cost investments, you know, broad-based index tracking ETFs. If I think about ZSP or S&P 500 index, nine basis points to get access to all of those companies. So this means a lot more of your money is in the markets working for you, more money in your pocket. Uh, last but not least, they're transparent. So they have daily holdings that you can see on the ETF issuer's website. And this is really a benefit because it allows you to see exactly what you're holding at any given time. It also allows you to build better portfolios because you can you know, avoid overlap within your portfolio and find ETFs that complement each other well. So all of those sort of summarize the why we love ETFs so much, but let's talk about um, some of the simple rules and things to consider when it comes to investing. So when we talk about advantages of ETFs, of course, liquidity was a big one. Um, generally, investors look at just trading volume as an indication of the level of liquidity. Um, but in reality, it's important to understand that there are multiple layers and volume should not be the only consideration. So another rule about looking at volume uh, that I thought I should mention is to ensure that you're looking at consolidated volume. So if you are looking at volume, certain data providers will only show you the volume traded on the TSX. And that's important. Uh, there are many exchanges here in Canada, um, NEO, Alpha, Omega, so many different exchanges. Um, so make sure that you're getting a consolidated view of the volume on that ETF if you are looking at that indicator. Um, you can use, uh, there's, a there's a website, quotemedia.com, where you can find consolidated volume, um, but there's plenty of others as well. Just ensure you're getting that full picture. 
The other layers of liquidity include uh, market makers, sorry Larry, if we just go back, who are out there posting bids and offers on the ETF. So market makers are always there, ready to buy available ETF shares from potential sellers and sell ETF shares to potential buyers. Um, so really for ETF investors, there's two prices that we can see. The price at which someone is willing to purchase the ETF, known as the bid, and the price at which someone is willing to sell the ETF, known as the offer or the ask. And the difference between these two prices is called the spread. And the bid offer spread is actually your best indicator of liquidity. Um, and in some cases with large, heavily traded ETFs, um, this bid offer spread can actually be tighter than the underlying. And then the third layer is uh, the creation and redemption process. So e market makers and ETF providers work together to create new units of the ETF when needed and redeem when needed. And this process really ensures that there is sufficient inventory to fill investors' orders. And it allows uh, large buys and sells on the market to occur without, uh, without much of an impact on the overall market. Um, there are a few other rules here on this slide for trading ETFs that we always suggest as investors uh, abide by. Number one, use a limit order uh, to avoid the, or to ensure that you're getting the price that you want. Um, number two, avoid trading ETFs right when the market opens and just before it closes. So I'd say about half hour after a market opens, you're okay. Um, and don't trade within that last half hour because that's what typically when the markets are the most volatile. Um, and then the last one is ensure you're trading ETFs when the underlying holdings are trading. So if I think about an emerging markets ETF or a China ETF, you wanna make sure you're trading that when those markets are open to make sure that you're getting um, a price that's most reflective of what those underlying securities are worth. So if we go to the next slide, ETFs uh, are generally low cost investments. Um, on the simple index replication side, you can find costs between five and 20 beeps. Um, for smart beta solutions, a little bit more. For active solutions, a bit higher there still. Um, if we look at Larry's ETF ZZZD, it has an all-in MER of 75 basis points, so very reasonable relative to other investment options out there. But the simple rule here for investors is to make sure that you're looking at the full picture when it comes to cost. And how do you do that? You look at this uh, regulatory document here, the ETF facts. This is different from the fact sheet. And this is a regulatory document that's gonna show you all the costs that you will incur. Anything else is really marketing. Um, so some providers will only have the management fee on their website, but that doesn't include taxes or admin fees, doesn't include the cost of leverage if the ETF uses leverage. Um, but on the ETF facts, you can find all of these costs um, and you can also have a look at average bid ask spreads and uh, trading expense ratios as well. So that's a simple uh, rule. And then if we go to the next slide, we also want to ensure that we're looking under the hood at the methodology behind the ETF to know how the portfolio is built, to know what it includes, to know what it does not include. Um, so different products might appear similar, for example, an emerging markets ETF. You know, the name might be very similar, but if you look under the hood, they may not even include the same countries. There may be very variable differences in terms of their sector weights. Um, another example would be if I look at low volatility ETFs, there's different ways to measure that volatility of the stock. Some will look at beta, some will look at standard deviation. Um, so really remember that not all ETFs are created equal. And uh, you want to understand the methodology because that can have um, a big impact on the outcome of your investment. Um, a best practice is to pull up the index fact sheet for index replicating ETFs, uh, and that'll dive really deep into the methodology um, behind it. Um, but if we're, you know, a smart beta or an active ETF, you can look at the prospectus to find out more around that. And then another rule um, when we're looking at the ETF is to ensure that we're watching the yields. So just because an ETF has a high distribution yield um, reported on the website, it doesn't mean that the ETF is necessarily earning that yield from the underlying securities. So make sure you have a good picture of what the portfolio is yielding versus what it's paying out, um, and that you understand that you might be getting some of your own capital back in the form of return of capital. Maybe that makes sense to you. Maybe you're looking for that higher level of cash flow. Just make sure that you're understanding the breakdown of that distribution. And then on the next slide, 
because ETFs are so transparent, we can definitely better understand what we're buying. Um, and this is going to help support better and quicker decision making by investors when it comes to how that portfolio is going to fit, or how that ETF is going to fit within their portfolio. Um, so a reminder to check out the holdings online. These are reported daily. Um, here you can understand a bit more about how that ETF is built. So if I'm looking at the S&P 500, I'm going to see, you know, Apple and Microsoft at the top because it's market cap weighted. Um, but there are other ways of weighting as well. There might be an equal weight approach to some products. And, and looking at the portfolio and having that transparency is really going to help you understand that a little bit better. You can also look at on the website um, the tracking error. So here we're showing the performance chart of the S&P 500 versus our ZSP ETF. And you want to ensure that with an index-based ETF, it's tracking that index closely. So those lines should be nice and close, which we're seeing showing here. Uh, this ETF is effectively tracking its index. So that, Larry, covers off the simple rules. I just wanted to close out on the next slide by highlighting um, some great resources that we have developed here at BMO ETFs for do-it-yourself investors, our ETF Market Insights website, and our YouTube channel. So each week I host a session with different industry experts on a wide range of educational topics, all focused around ETF investing and the markets, all in 30 minutes. And our audience can, can submit questions every week, which we get to on future shows. Uh, so it's a great resource for you. We also have a website, etfmarketinsights.com, where there's a ton of resources for you. There's also ETF tools where you can compare ETFs or screen ETFs. Um, so I definitely encourage you to check out our YouTube channel, our etfmarketinsights.com website, um, and subscribe so that you're notified when uh, future episodes go live. Next Friday, we're going to be talking about currency, so I hope you can all tune in. Um, and then we have our upcoming Fall Into ETFs event running at the end of October. So make sure to check out that YouTube channel for more info on that. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me, Larry, and uh, I'll turn it back to you. Well, thanks so much. And again, the partnership with BMO has been fantastic. I know I've been a guest on your YouTube channel uh, doing the ETF insights, and uh, we'll look forward to, to doing a lot more of that down the road. Absolutely. All right. Thanks thank so you. much. Be well. Bye. Okay, so, you know, I've got a YouTube, everyone's got a YouTube channel. So it's really a, a great um, repository for all our video content. And uh, so we continue to use that. If you're, if you're not subscribed already, you know, please have a look at that. You'll be notified for our weekly updates that we do, these type of webinars, any, any other um, content that we put out there. Um, will will reside on our YouTube channel. So something you might want to think about if you haven't yet already. Welcome to the Investor's Guide for Thriving. Uh, our agenda is, you know, I, I thought about what am I going to kick it off with? Do I talk about markets? Obviously, I'm going to talk a little bit about markets. But, you know, this being the most difficult year ever, and I mean ever, 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 certainly in modern history, for the average portfolio for investors. What we thought was safety and fixed income turns out this year isn't. Why inflation? We covered a lot of that last year. Um, we, we had been very concerned and warning about, you know, the typical bond 60-40 portfolio. How do you protect yourself? We talked a lot a bit about ETFs and funds that were able to do that uh, and help mitigate the downside, but there's very little place to hide. Over the years, I've, I've told you about long bonds and duration as a way to protect portfolios because they're inversely correlated to stocks. That hasn't worked. Um, what has worked pretty well is those buffer type ETFs and a lot of the protection, and we talked about how we incorporated that into our portfolios going forward. And and the the basic reason is is what we've learned over the years. And I, I think having a plan, um, and whether you're formally a fiduciary and an, and an asset manager and a wealth manager, and you have discretionary 
advice over client portfolios and you have an investment policy statement or your uh, Canada pension plan and you have an investment policy statement that basically says this is the kind of outcome we need to achieve. It, having that plan going into what should I buy? Wait, let me call Larry on Monday morning and, and ask him. You know, all good, but but you don't have the plan. And, you know, not knowing puts you at a disadvantage, not knowing how to do and what to do. So I'm going to talk a lot about what I've learned in over 35 years now of, of making decisions and making mistakes. And hopefully that gives you a lot of insight into my thought process and um you know we'll, and then we'll we'll get into into the q and a that that you guys have have sent in already so you know uh, john maynard keynes very famous nobel prize winning economist um you know basically said you know when when the facts change i i change my mind you know what what do you do and and this week uh, Ray Dalio, basically, who had been saying, you know, cash is king because he's been very bearish, basically said, I've changed my mind about cash as an asset. I no longer think cash is trash. Um, you know, so so basically yields are higher, money, money starting to pay, um, you know, being being safe in portfolios cash cash was trash because there weren't any yields there now we actually have you know reasonable uh, yields in in money markets the yield curve is very flat point being here when we talk about decision making the behavioral side of of the decision when you call larry when you do what you do to make a decision about investing that's largely behavioral or technical versus what should I buy? You know, what ETF should I use? What stock should I pick? How should my portfolio be constructed by way of risk, by way of bonds and stocks and commodities and all the other things we could potentially have in, your, in our portfolios? And so the fundamental side of, of investing and what security should we buy, and a little bit of when, is part of the plan. You know, knowing in advance what you're going to do when something happens is extraordinarily valuable. But when you do it, you know, that's the decision. That's the pulling the trigger. So, you know, you, you can't get caught in the headlights. When the evidence changes, you need to you need to change. And that was one of the key observations that you know Keynes made back in the 1920s. Then there was this book that was put out in the 1930s by Graham and Dodd, and everyone will know Ben Graham was a, a teacher of Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett has said this many times. Um, but what they had kind of said in that 1934 securities analysis textbook is the essence of making the decision uh, and when and, and the emotional response to it, and then lining up that with your time frame. So the, the phrase goes, the market is not a weighing machine right? It, it's a voting machine. So when you hear that, that's very much the noise of the market. That's the emotional side. And in the short run, okay, so the, the, the story goes on. So in the short run, it's a voting machine, the emotional side. In the long run, it's a weighing machine. And when you think about that and you drill down, you know, when, when I came across this quote and this notion going back 30 plus years ago, as I was learning about markets and and how to think about making a decision and on what to own and when to own it, 
you know, I still make mistakes in this area of of confusing the vote which with the way the time frame analysis you get we all get caught up in the noise of the day and sometimes miss the bigger picture and that's normal it's normal behavioral to understand that so when when we think about this equation in the technical world in the short run it's a voting machine that's the sentiment side in the long run, it's a weighing machine. That's the relative performance side. That's what security do we want to own that on trend is outperforming, but on a voting basis, when do we want to own it? And my style has adapted through the combination of being a technical analyst, a chartered market technician, and a fundamental analyst, a, a, a CFA, um, you know, a chartered financial analyst. So I can understand how to build a portfolio and how to choose securities. It's a little bit of what Aaron talked about. You don't have to be a CFA or a CMT to do your due diligence on liquidity and, and what to pick and which is the best tool to trade. I get a lot of questions, which ETF should I buy? Not so much, you know, as it, should I buy it now, but which one? I don't know if I should buy the Vanguard one for international markets or the iShare one or the BMO one or the all the other ones that are out there. And the answer is, do your due diligence, know your cost, know your spread, know what it's costing you to trade. And so that sets up your, okay, I know what I'm going to do when I'm going to do it. It does, that part doesn't help with the when I'm going to do it, right? So the interaction of the voting machine and the weighing machine is really a combination of fundamental and technical analysis. Um, and, and that's, you know, when Graham and Dodd did their securities analysis book, and talked about the voting machine, they were talking about behavior. This is, this is CMT, but they went on to poo-poo technical analysis as in chart reading and, and Warren Buffett says, you know, the entrails of the market. And, and I don't think really understands what technical analysis really is. It isn't really about the indicators. It's about how you take the information, interpret it up here, so that when you make that investment decision, it's it's with all the information you have, it's the best decision you can. You shouldn't even think about at that point, what do you go buy, right? It's, well, if this is happening in the world, this ETF, this stock is probably gonna give me a good outcome. So that's what I, well, that's, you want to do all that work up front. Okay. So, so that's about, you know, all about the security selection and, and, and knowing that when the opportunity develops, what do I do? And I think the world going forward is going to get very, very difficult. I started to get really <laughs> bearish, negative, uh, Listen, you can call me a perma bear, but the reality is that the safe part of the portfolio as interest rates started to go negative in the world messes up completely and utterly the idea of, of what Nobel prizes were given out and managing risk in portfolios. And 2022 is the bold face underscore perfect life example of what I was ta started talking about, you know, seven years ago now, when you had 15% of all the debt in the world trading with a negative yield. And so when you get into the behavioral side and really understanding why you need a plan, you've all seen those, you know, blogs and research and where, where you put up a, a headline. Once that news gets onto the front page of the paper, it's it's over. 
you know, um, I remember this book. I, I read it, you know, 20 years ago when, when it came out called The Man Who Beats the S&P 500, Investing with Bill Miller. Bill Miller ran the Leg Mason Value Fund for 11 years in a row. 11 years in a row, he beat the S&P 500. Unheard of. The number of people on the planet at that point that had beat the S&P 500 11 years in a row, you can count them on one hand and, and, and almost on one finger. It wasn't Warren Buffett, it was, it was this guy. And so he wrote a book. And guess what happened the next five years running? Bill Miller of the Lake Mason Value Fund underperformed the S&P 500 every single year. So when you look back in retrospective and think about that and what does it mean, it means probably that he's an ordinary guy. It's exceptional in, in a way, but he's an ordinary guy making decisions about investing. Just so happened he was the lucky SOB that made his style of investing just happen to work during that window. And then his style of investing, because he didn't change what he did, just stopped working. It didn't matter that he liked a certain type of stock. It didn't happen for him. So when, when, it, when I think about all that, it relates back to as an individual. And when I'm creating portfolios for clients and funds and, and outcomes, you know, I think about, well, what is, what is my goal here? And, and the goal for the average financial advisor in Canada and the world is to deliver a return that is going to meet their financial needs, uh, i.e. Their, their income needs, their goals for their retirement. The vast majority of people who are saving money in their retirement accounts is for retirement. But that is, is infinitely different than, for example, saving money in an RESP for kids. That is a finite life. As the kids get closer to needing that money to use, the risk parameters need to change. If you're saving in your TFSA to buy a house in a couple of years, you know, that, that's, you know, that's soon. Your risk needs to be very different then if you're a Canada pension plan and you have to fund a 7% in perpetuity obligation to Canadians uh, to meet the obligation that the government has made for all the people paying in over the years, that's a very different outcome than a charitable foundation that must spend the proceeds every year on whatever their charity is uh, and can only let it grow at a certain rate and so forth because of its tax exempt status. Uh, so depending on what your account is, what type of account is, and what the goal of that is, should have a very different portfolio. So, you know, as I think about this, should everybody just be 60, 40 or 70, 30? And the answer is absolutely not. For me, a TFSA, I nicknamed this years ago when it first came out, totally for speculation account. Because you're putting in after tax dollars and all the money you make, you're never going to pay tax on. And so if you're going to take any risk at all, serious risk, growth type risk, this is the place to do it. Yet I constantly get questions on BNN. You know, I got a tax-free savings account. Should I put some bonds in there? It's not a savings account. It's a, the government has given you a vehicle to speculate in. Now, that doesn't apply if you're a young 30-something and you're not even making your RSP contributions every year and saving for retirement, and you only have a tax-free savings account, and really the goal of that account is to save for something, whether that's a house, a condo, or, or a car. Therefore, it should not be a speculative account. So 
what you do as an individual is wholly related to your individual outcome. And so, you know, when you call in on BNN and say, Larry, what do you think of this? And I have no idea who you are. It is so hard to give you a, 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 an answer that, that I'm confident in. And so what I can tell you about a stock or an ETF is a little bit about what I see in the picture, what I understand the fundamentals to be, and how much of that would fit into a portfolio that I'm running for I'm, my mandates. But again, I have no idea who you are. And, and I've mentioned this to BNN over the years that you know they have all these great smart portfolio managers and analysts come on you know, market call and talk about their different things and buy this and sell this and here's my favorite picks. And you have to take that information and not go buy it. I got a call this week on BNN and it was great actually, we were back in the studio for the first time. And, um, you know, producer whispers in my ear, we got a call on ZWU, the BMO covered call utility ETF. And, oh, great, let's take that call. So I, I give him the thumbs up and caller comes on. Larry, what, what do you think? You know, should I put, I'm, I'm 80 years old or 70, I can't remember the age of the gentleman. Should I put all my money in, in the yield so good? Should I put all my portfolio in ZWU? And it's, it's like, oh, no, no, sir, please don't do that. That that is I I I can't. How could someone recommend to someone they don't even know, don't know how much money they have, don't know what their life expectancy is, don't know what their income is, tell someone to do that and and how much of it they should put in their portfolio. And again, that experience and, and the experiences over more than 15 years now of of you know all you all you people who are are fans of Berman's Call and watching these. You know, my educational efforts here and many of you over the years who have become clients in various aspects of, of our business, you know, it's really about the customization of the outcome for you. And, you know, you go through a cycle and you learn a little bit more and you go through another cycle and you learn a little bit more. So, you know, I thought today would be a great idea of a, a culmination, if you will, of all the things that I've learned and, and mistakes. This is really the, the book I'm writing and I'm not a good writer, is, and it's a labor of love for me to finish, and one day I will. Um, you know, it really is about, um, you know, the experiences and understanding, and at the end of the day, you know, how do we make a better decision? And so, you know, here's, here's a great example of a great company, you know, NVIDIA. So here's, here's the ticker, NVIDIA. Charts a, a few days old now, but you get the idea. And you look at the chart, and I highlighted this this red line here because that was um, a major announcement that Nvidia came out with. Um, and and you know that you know if you can click on that and look at the story and everything else. But the stock ripped that day big time. I don't know if you can see the candle stick there at all, but uh, and then for a couple of days and then pulled back and tested the 200 day average. So here's a stock that that is in our universe of, of stocks that that we would own um, because we like it. You know, risk reward, you know, valuation is not compelling at the moment. So then the question is, well, well, how much, you know, do you own of this thing? And do you hold, do you just buy it and hold it or you trade it? So what kind of investor are you? Again, something I don't know when you call in. Um, here is a stock that I've owned probably two or three times over the years, uh, over the last couple of years that we started doing stock portfolios. We, we launched single stock portfolios and started to move assets a little bit away from ETFs in the last couple of years, because I, I think that the index return going forward is going to be a challenge um, given the state of the world um, for the next, I don't know, foreseeable future, let's call that, inflation being stickier, valuations having to come down, et cetera. And, and there's more opportunity perhaps trading individual stocks 
than there is in the index buy and hold world. I'm not saying I don't like ETFs. I love ETFs. They're great for lots of things. What I'm saying is if you're just buying and holding a 60-40 basket for the next 10 years, your return might be 2 3 4%. And if inflation's running and it comes down as the Fed hopes and is running at 2 3 4%, you will have no real growth in your savings. So is that important for you or not? Anyways, point being on this stock, here's a great stock. I've owned it two or three times. I've probably traded it for a 10 to 20% profit during that period. It was half, one, one and a half percent on my portfolio. And, and from when we launched stock portfolios in late 2020, the stock, if I bought and held it, great company. Throughout that whole piece, I would have had a tremendous profit and now had nothing. But I've traded it a few times. I've made, I don't know, 20 or 30% on those holdings. And now I've got options in the portfolio to buy it again, should it come back to a certain price. And, and I look at every single thing about you know, are you a trader? Are you an investor? When do you buy? When to sell? That that is the question that people ask. You know, every week when when they call in to BNN. And so, you know, I think about that a lot. I think about it in terms of how I make decisions, and what I'm trying to do is is teach you how to make a better decision. So, do I own Nvidia now? The answer is no. Would I own it lower? So, what what did I do a few months ago? When, when NVIDIA was $175. I bought what's called a ratio put spread. And so I bought a put at, I don't know, it was 100 and 115, $120 put. And I sold two 105 puts. And so those puts at 105 is where I was comfortable buying it. And if you draw the chart and you do the retracements and you look at where it might be oversold, you know, I was okay with the valuation fundamentally there and so forth. So I was happy owning it there, but I didn't like it when it was here. And I, you know, and I liked it a little more here, but not a lot. And so I bought these put spreads and then the market starts selling off. And so I'm making money on the long put. So here's a position that I put into the portfolio where I made money as the stock went down. The position netted me a yield that I was guaranteed to make. And if it gets to on expiry, which is October 21st, a couple of weeks from now, if it gets to 105, I'm gonna own it at 105. Now, if, if at that point it's 100, I own it at 105. But remember, it's compared to what I did at the time. So if you understand your toolbox and know what you can do in your portfolio, so that's a position that you can't do in a registered account, right? If there's a margin call, you can't meet it. They won't let you do that. So you can't do naked put writing, but you can do that in a cash account or margin account. So it depends again, I don't know what, capabilities you have if you're comfortable with leverage and what to recommend. But that's kind of what I was doing. So, you know, great stock, great company, testing the 200-day average as we're going up in early, you know, with good news coming up, it gets overbought, RSI, sell it out. Listen, I, I sold this thing out after buying it at the 200-day average a few weeks later. And I made my target return and then the thing you know doubled and boy did i feel silly no i didn't because it wasn't in my plan to trade it like that okay we don't know where the top's going to be we don't know where the bottom's going to be folks what i've learned over the years anybody who tells you that they know that is a charlatan run <laughs> because nobody knows so how do you think about investing? About a, a decade ago, came across a firm called Edo Search. 
And in the last few years with COVID, we kind of dropped the ball on this, but you know, we were actively looking at doing a fund with them. And and I, I've talked about this on you know Berman's Call Roadshows before. It might have been back 2016, 2015, when we were doing live events. And I had demonstrated what they were doing. So think about this chart here of Apple. The example on their website, which I clipped this from, and the link is there, and you can read their white paper on it. What did the stock do in the last three months? Let's take that pattern. Let's match it to every other stock pattern of three months in duration that looks like that behavior. Let's project it forward on what happened on average. So that green line projection one month out is the average return of what Apple would do based on that behavior. But every stock in general that had that behavior, that was the projection with a standard deviation. So uncertainty about that projection that it could have been as high as 107.93, but it also could have been as low as 87.48. What that outlook does is say, I've got a potential return and I've got a variance, standard deviation risk. Now I can put those together and get a return adjusted for the level of risk. That's what we do in here. And that's what the computer does. Folks, the future of investing is not going to be Larry making calls on, on charts. It's going to be Edo search. It's going to be creating a portfolio based on a computerized probability of the outcome. And it's going to come to an ETF near you. And they have some of this AI type ETFs right now. And they're getting some based on social media hits and other things. And you're going to see some in the future, you know, based on this stuff. I, I can guarantee you that they're going to be more expensive because there's some value added versus being nine basis points for the replication of a dumb index. Let's call it the S&P 500. Not that it's a dumb index, but it's a rules based, you know, transparent index compared to an active strategy, always making a rebalancing decision based on this. And so our philosophy on how we run our equity portfolios is exactly this thinking. What do I think about the stock fundamentally? I've already decided that I wanna own it because it's a stock that I like as a company. It's a good company. I've also decided that based on the economic environment we're in, this is a company that could, not will, that could outperform the dumb index, right? But at any point in time, so I didn't like Apple in this example, maybe at 110, but now all of a sudden, you know, at 90 something, you know, kind of the risk return is better. I like it, it's, there's more value to it. So, you know, then the question is, well, how much Apple should you own? And if you're trying to beat the S&P 500 and you like Apple's risk return adjusted, right? For the volatility, then you need to have a position that's bigger than Apple and its weight in that index. So you're seeing how all the pieces are, are you know, all starting to come together now. Um, so I think that's that that learning is 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 really you know really important. Um, so we we've had the worst year, you know, basically ever. Um, once bond yields started to turn negative, if you look at a global, so VT is the uh, Vanguard Total World All Country All Cap ETF trades in the U.S., so it's in U.S. dollars. You could change that to Canadian dollars and get that equivalent Canadian return for a Canadian. It, you know, if Canada Canadian dollars outperforming up and down, you know, over a long run, it's going to be pretty similar, but it can deviate you know, in any given year pretty significantly. And then the all bond index. So the Blue, Bloomberg Global Aggregate Total Return Index unhedged. That's every bond in the world, basically. 
that's investment grade, no high yield in, in that index. And if we take a 60, 40, 50, 50, 40, 60 of those, that ETF and that bond index, and say from the end of 2015, when we first started to see a huge amount of debt in the world go negative, you know, ECB and, and Mario never really happened in North American markets for a couple of reasons, but, but largely in Europe and Japan, you, you had seen that. You know, I made a call at that point that the 60-40 model was basically broken and it wasn't going to deliver for investors. So the total world index in US dollars annualized up till a couple of days ago or the end of September when, when I created this uh, chart, 7.09% um, was the average annual return. And for the bond, a loss. Why was there a loss? Because bond yields were negative in, in parts of the world. Now, if you looked at just the Canadian bond market, you have a positive return in there, or there's the US, there's a positive return. But generally speaking, for the world, um, you know, it was a negative number. And I'm looking at a global um, you know, perspective here. So two, three, four percent was your average return up until end of last month uh, in that portfolio. Um, and that's without cost. There's no sort of, well, the, the ETF cost of, of VT, which is 18 basis points. That doesn't include paying a financial advisor, planner for, for their advice on creating a portfolio. So what I had said going back in retrospective now, obviously had we done this uh, at the peak of the market um, you know, late last year, those numbers would be higher because this year, as we know, that 60-40 portfolio has been terrible. But let's have a look actually. So again, at the end of September, when you look year to date of that global 60-40, 50-50, 40-60, those are the numbers, folks. So not annualized, but nine months. If you project it out for a full year, you'd look at the annualized, but look at the total return column, the second one there. And that's the you know price return and the dividend return, uh, total return. So you could see in VT, the difference between the price change and the total return, there was a yield there, um, but the other indexes don't kind of don't have that in it. Um, uh, so we've used the underlying indexes, total return. So you wanna look at that number. Bonds down global, 20, down 20%, equities down 25 and a half. So you're balanced. Again, worst start to the year ever. And it's the bond side that was supposed to be protecting you. And folks, for the last seven years has given you nothing. And now yields are higher, so there's some value there again. But just sitting in a generic balanced portfolio without alternatives, without different ways of getting yield into your portfolios, whether they're as simple as covered calls, emphasizing higher dividends or, or private you know, debt markets. We talked a lot about that last fall, that we saw this, this bad year potentially coming and how other ways do you get yield into your portfolios that the, the average, uh, you know, investors, you know, pretty having a, a pretty bad year. Um, and, and so, you know, when I, when I look back in retrospective and, and talk about some of the mistakes I made. I, I highlighted a, a handful. There are more than these folks, believe me, <laughs> um, but there's some interesting stories behind them. So I was a junior analyst at, at uh, Burns Fry, it's now part of Nesbitt Burns. Um, and we had a mining analyst. He was thought of as the number one analyst in Canada and morning meeting, he's talking about this company called Princeton Mining. They're going to have all the copper in the world. He was down in Peru, he saw it. It was the copper Briex, guys. So here's what I did. I had just gotten the settlement uh, for the insurance claim I had from a car accident that I was in. And uh, I had back surgery in, in 1988. The good news about that is while I was doing recovery from that, I, had, I met my wife. Uh, in the gym, so 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 it worked out okay that way. But you know, later in life, the doctor said you're going to have more BRAC problems, and I, I'm going to actually 
have to have back surgery again in, in November. So hopefully that all goes well. Um, but if you do see us postpone a week or something, you'll know that uh, uh, I'm probably not up to, uh, to it. But, but it's a per fairly simple surgery um, in, in sort of fusing some of my discs and, and fixing some of them um, you know, as, as I've gotten older and aged and whatever, and probably play too much golf and hockey anyways. So going back to that, so I got this settlement and I paid off my student debt. I had all these OSAP loans and we had a little bit left over and we were saving it for, for the house. And I was trading, I, you know, I created some indicators and I was trading options back then. And, and anyways, I took the entire money. I closed out my positions. I took it all. I maxed my um, uh, aeroplan gold card. I got 5,000 points for that, I think. Um, anyways, I put it all in a margin account. Th this guy knew that this was going to be the biggest copper find in the world. And he was there. And he knew. And so on margin, I bought this stock at, I don't know, $12, whatever it was, on, on Tuesday. And by Friday, it closed at 18. I had 30, 40% of the house. The analyst said, this stock's worth $30. I wasn't gonna stay around that long, but anyways. So um, the, the results of their latest dig came out over the weekend and uh, Turns out they don't have all the copper in the world. Turns out they didn't have any copper or very little. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they still had some, obviously. But the grade was bad. And anyways, whether they smoked this guy and lied to him and created a whole falsehood, I, I don't know. That It was never a thing that came out. But point is, the stock opened that next day at 10-something. I had bought it at 12 on margin, fully leveraged. And I mean credit cards. I was fully leveraged. Every cent we had. And uh, it was by the time I unwound the position, all the money in the bank account was gone. And my credit card was maxed and, and I had nothing left. And I never told my wife. And uh, about six months later, she, she said, um, where's the, where, where's the uh, money in the savings account? And I, I told her I did a PhD in risk management. I took a course and uh, you know, I thought that was funny, but she didn't. And um, you know, so it was it was the emotional side of of me having so much confidence. It was greed in the sense that, you know, I wanted to, but but I did it because I felt I was gonna it was a sure thing. Um, anyways, there are no sure things in the world. So so the problem with that was one, a lack of plan. I, I gambled. It, it was it was not a good decision. In 1993. Um, I created an indicator. Uh, it was at the CSTA forecast lunch. I showed everybody my indicator. It was written up. I got an article about me in the National Post, and I showed my trading tickets and things like that. And um, anyways, I called it, I named it after my son. It was a trading line. I called it the Brandon line. And anyways, doesn't matter. I was trading options, and I was in a position, and I was up, and I was working out, and then. As, as many, you know, back then you'd watch Friday night, you'd watch Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser and the elves and one of my, you know, favorite elves and now a, you know, very close friend of mine and mentor Ralph Acampora was an elf. And he came out and said, I, and I don't even remember bullish, bearish, whatever. And so I hope, oh my God, Ralph, you know, Ralph reads the charts. I'm just learning about him. I was just starting my CMT back then. And, and uh, anyways, got out. And it turns out Ralph was wrong. And so again, why did I do that? Because I listened to someone and I didn't have a plan. I didn't stick with it. I had a trading model, but I let the noise of the market, I let the voting part of it influence, you know, what I thought, you know, based on, on my read of the market. 1995, I was trading commodities. I was trading on a commodity desk for a firm called Marlo Lemire um, out of business. They had some, some not so good people running it. And um, anyways, um, 
you know, getting caught in a limit market with leverage. So the lesson learned there, and fortunately it wasn't a lesson that I learned, it was a client. Um, and they were uh, trading uh, Japanese yen and they were selling it and leverage in futures markets. Anyways, one day these guys had a $5 million margin call and they stopped answering the phone. And ultimately what brought the firm down, um, you know, the guy who ran the futures group actually had to go, it was called the Credit Bank of Cambodia, if you can believe that. So lesson learned there about leverage and, and being greedy. Um, and all this speaks to really, you know, having a plan and knowing, you know, some leverage is good. There's opportunities to use it, but how much do you use? When that guy called in this week and said he was going to put all his money in one thing, I just went, you know, um, because, you know, that, that really is a mistake. Um, in 1996, I'm, I'm working in Boston. I'm writing my CMT level three paper and I submitted it. It was, it was an indicator that I created for the bond market. And um, Phil Roth, who many would know in the technical world, he was the technical analyst for Dean Witter at the time. Um, Phil actually worked in the World Trade Tower and the plane hit, I don't know, I think he was 10 stories above his office and he got out. But, but he was in charge of the CMT research papers at the time, the thesis that you had to write. And I wrote it on an index. Anyways, they gave it to this guy. This guy, very high profile market technician, created some indicators. He criticized, he was completely wrong. He didn't know the asset class was fixed income. He was an equity guy and he, he it was just wrong. And, and I went back and really criticized market technicians group at the time that they gave my paper to someone who wasn't qualified. And boy, did that raise, um, but, but that led, led to a le lesson about ego. And so this guy calls me up and what do you mean I'm not qualified? <laughs> and uh, so when you let ego get in your way, that, that can lead to bad decision-making. And in this case, it, it wasn't my ego per se saying mine was right and you were wrong, but it, it, it just, it was a, a lesson about being humble a little bit more. And I, I think that that's an important uh, characteristic and learning um, about markets. Uh, in 2001, as a strategist for CIBC World Markets, I was trading a futures-based uh, prop book for the bank. So banks money trading, not for clients, but for the bank. And my goal was to make money. And I had, you know, I was trading bonds and, and Euro dollars and, and S&P futures and all kinds of commodities and stuff, but mainly, mainly the financial ones in the markets. And um, at the 2001, they decided to stop the sale of 30-year bonds. It was a complete surprise to the market. Um, and all of a sudden, it, I, I lost my, I, I was having a phenomenal year trading and I had lost like 70% of my P&L you know, overnight, closed my position out. And, and so I looked at that and I said, my bet size was wrong. I was so confident in what interest rates were gonna do because of what the chart said, but I didn't have the bet size right. So one of the things I've learned over the year is bet size. And, and that speaks to leverage. So if your bet size is too big and you're using leverage, you've got catastrophic risk, risk of ruin. Um, so that was an important lesson learned. Uh, calling the market bottom and, and you know not maximizing the outcome. So in 2002, literally to the day, um, I put out a research report and I called the bottom of the dot-com burst. And you know, I, what did I buy at the time? Well, I, I thought technology stocks would bounce back the most. And so back then I bought the Qs. And we didn't have the hedge version. I didn't have ZQQ at that time. There was only the US dollar version. And so ultimately I was right. And the NASDAQ rallied significantly and I probably sold it out a few years later. I, I took a 30% hit on the currency because I was holding something in US dollars. And so I, I netted out making a lot of money on the trade, but the NASDAQ doubled. And I think I made 40% because I had lost about 30% on the currency. And 
Yeah, I don't remember the exact numbers, but you know, I made the wrong bet again. And of the pl now back then there wasn't the vehicle to do that. Okay. And so, you know, when the hedged ETF started to come in where you could hedge the currency or not, I'm like, wow, what a great innovation. What a great ability for people to not make that mistake. And so when the markets are oversold, the Canadian dollar is typically very weak. Um, you don't want that US dollar exposure. You want to own Canadian dollars when they're cheap. So you want that, you know, ZQQ. So you don't get hurt by the, the US the Canadian dollar rallying back as risk recovers, uh, as, it, as it almost always does. In 2006, um, wrote a research report, uh, report uh, in cooperation with the economics team at CIBC. Uh, Benny Tal, who, who many people will, will know as being an excellent, excellent economist out there, had lunched with uh, Jerry McGaughy, who, who at the time was the, chair, uh, the chairman of, of CIBC. Um, investment banking later on went to become the chairman of the entire bank, but he was running investment banking and we were chatting about real estate CIBC was involved in, in the CDO market and anyways, lost billions of dollars for the firm. But, you know, so I called that real estate bubble correctly. I would have been as early as, as some of the US guys and it would have been very painful, you know, in 2007 as things were still working. Um, but I didn't make a bet at all. And so that's not as bad. It's it's better to be out wishing you were in than in wishing you were out. But making a big market call where you were right and not having a bet is, is equally as bad. And again, wrong bet, wrong bet size, not making a bet. It's the lack of having a plan and knowing what to do when the opportunity presents itself. During the great financial crisis, I, I was far too focused on voting and not weighing. And that was a time frame mismatch, which I again made that mistake in 2020, trying to be too perfect on, on getting the market bottom. Uh, as I wasn't, I, at that point, when the market is under duress, you want to start being a weighing machine and thinking, Okay, do I buy now? For, is this the bottom? Do I buy now for the next three to five years? What does that look like? And the answer is always, you, you got to be able to shift from the voting machine to the weighing machine as the opportunities develop. And, and so those were some of the things that I've, I've learned over the years and some of the, you know, the big mistakes that, that I made. And every time you make a mistake, you got to think about it. How can I make a better decision? Um, so I think you must have an investment policy as an individual. For most individuals, that's, that's a financial plan. Knowing what your goal is and what your outcome is um, will lower the anxiety that you will feel through the ups and downs. Now, some of you have more of that than others. People with more savings, you know, can weather the storm a little bit better, but you know, if you think in dollar terms, if you have 10 million and that 10 million goes down to 7 million because there's a, been a 30% correction and you think that you just lost $3 million, you know, can you imagine what Elon Musk think every day, you know, about losing a couple billion dollars on his Tesla value? Um, so so you, if you have that investment policy and know that your portfolio is aligned properly to achieve that outcome, you, you, you should have a better outcome. The problem is most advisors today, and really why we, we started Q Wealth and, and part of the FinTech involved with that and really getting our portfolios to be computerized and, and the investment decisions based increasingly more on doing your homework, doing your due diligence, understanding what you're owning, um, and, and, def and driving the portfolio to have an outcome for a client adjusted for their anxiety, i.e. level of risk, I think really is the future. Um, and, and I do think, you know, for the next decade, things are gonna be a challenge from the traditional way of thinking 
So you've got to remember your time frame and style and the voting and weighing horizons. So, so, so important because, you know, there, there was a famous trader and I can't, Larry, what's his name? You know, buy when they're yelling and, and uh, no, sell when they're yelling and buy when they're running or something like that. I can't remember exactly the phrase, but it's, it's, you know, buy when there's blood in the streets, it's that essence of things. So, you know, having a tool to measure that is, is really what we created pro eyes for to, to help everybody. Um, you know, hall of famers in baseball hit three, 300. That means 70% of the time they, they get it wrong. What you have to do is swing at the best pitches and that's the opportunity and understanding the risk return of the investment. And if you understand nothing else from being an investor, be friggin' humble. Understand Mr. Market is way, 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 way smarter than any individual. And again, I caution you, those who think and, and present themselves as having the secret sauce that only if you bought what they're selling, you would have all the money in the world. I'll just point to some of the Bitcoin shills out there, but <laughs> won't get into that. Um, just just be humble. Understand how something fits into your portfolio and, and how to create it so that you have an outcome so that you can minimize your EQ. So ProEyes is a tool to help with that. On BNN this week, I, I talked about the opportunity that was there. We should get a trading rally. Market's ripping higher right now. How long is it going to last, Larry? First question. I have no idea. <laughs> That's a simple truth, folks. We don't know. But what we have to do is recognize when the risks are attractive, turn to the weighing machine. When the risks are not attractive, turn to the voting machine and make sure what we do. If you think you can be all in cash and bet, get back in, back and forth, the, the pro eyes indicator is helpful for that. You know, are we at a point in time now where this is just a trade, a bounce in a bear market, or is this the time to think about the next three to five years? So I think a little bit of both because where we are now, three to five years, equity is probably higher. Bonds probably better price wise, yields a little bit lower, uh, not a lot lower, a little bit lower. So that would give me an expected return of the next few years of a 60-40 balance portfolio of, let's call it four, four or 5%. And if inflation's running at four or five over that horizon, you got nothing. So that's kind of you know, where I'm at if you're asking about a bit of a forecast here, but you know, reduce the cost of investing, having a plan. The, the, the biggest cost of investing is managing your emotions. If you have a plan and stick to it and not be subject to the latest, you know, tip. So conclusion, buy NVIDIA. Got my CFA hat on. Good company. Just don't ask me how much and when to buy it. And that's really the, the technical side of things. So, you know, I, I hope that was enjoyable for you. I got about 15 minutes left to go through some of your questions. I'm going to hit the ones that came in online first. If we have time, we can maybe get to some some others that, that may have come in later. So what are expectations for earnings going to be? Uh, more doom and gloom, or is there light at the end of the tunnel? Well, tunnel, tunnel it is. So here, let me bring up this chart here, and I prepared for you. Uh, this is a year-to-date on the top S&P 500 as of, of the close of October 5th. And, um, and the earnings outlook for the end of 2023. So we call that year plus one, $243.66, which is up over the past couple of days. It was down at 242. So this moves around every time an analyst upgrades a stock or downgrades a stock. And it's weighted by all the S&P 500 constituents. And it's all the analyst estimates. It's not one analyst. It's the consensus number for, the, for those stocks uh, weighted by their weight in the index. And if you look at what the actual earnings are trailing in the bank, 
$204. So if you think about the next year plus the end, to the end of 2023, if you think about the forward 12 months, 233.69. So, you know, third quarter, third quarter, but to end of year. So basically it's saying that you're going to get a 4.27% earnings growth in the fourth quarter of next year, but you're going to get 14.5% earnings growth between now and the end of a year from now. Folks, we're going into a recession. Analysts don't have a clue what's coming. So this earnings period will be important. What are companies going to say? Well, we've got a lot of pre-warnings in the last few weeks. Look at this September. So it's come down a little bit. But, you know, you can see it here. It's come down a little bit in mid-September. It bounced back. From the beginning of the year, the end of 2023 forecast was $242. You can see at the beginning here, um, 241 and a half, I guess. And we're higher than that. So as this year has progressed, and all that the Fed's doing, and all the strong US dollar that's going to negatively impact earnings, analysts still think that we're going to get 15% earnings growth over the next year. I think they're absolutely out to lunch. So is this priced into the market? And the, the answer is no. So if there's another leg down coming, it's going to be the repricing of what actual earnings are going to be as we go through a recession. Again, don't ask me because I don't know. I'm one opinion of what I think. So right now markets are set up for a bounce. And as soon as we get to some level, which we can look at charts and whatever, and you could say 4,200, 4,300, you could say 4,000, you could you, retracements, you could do all kinds of things to say, where do I start to get concerned again? And for me, that answer is a little bit higher than here. How much, I don't know. Um, but we would look to um, to take the volatility risk down in our portfolios again. So what does that mean? Well, that means you know adding adding a hedge where we can do that um, in the portfolios, so that when the markets and if the markets go down again, we don't go down as much. And and that's really all you can hope for. You can try to time it, but what if you're wrong? What if this is the bottom? You know, there's a study that went around today and looking at bread thrust, the amount of stocks that have rallied off a level deep oversold condition. Historically, the markets, you know, from 1950 on and breadth, and when you get a, a move like this, they're up one year later. Always. <laughs> so time to think about the weighing machine or are we still voting? What's the answer, folks? I don't know but have a plan and understand what to do when, when the opportunities are there. So our indicators this week told us the opportunities are there. We lifted all our hedges, covered the shorts um, where, where we could, where it made sense, and increased the risk, get more growth into the portfolio so that whatever bounce we get to whatever level it's going to go to, we can get some, some performance on that. Uh, we saw the UK pound drop last week. It appears US currency is rising. Can you please explain uh, why this is happening and what we can expect to see in terms of volatility in global currency? The new government that, that came in um, after Boris Johnson, um, Truss, uh, made some absolutely horrible decisions in recent weeks that put a lot of stress on their currency and finances at the same time, you know, they're gonna have to tighten, Fed's gonna have to tighten more. They announced QE last week, you know, uh, where they had started QT and, and temporarily. And so you look at a long-term chart of, of the UK. And so we hit levels not seen since the, uh, um, the Plaza Accord. So, you know, as, as the U.S. was fighting interest rates, you look at this marker here, uh, early 1980s, when Volcker took over the Federal Reserve and he started raising interest rates aggressively, eventually he killed inflation. You know, bond yields started to, to come down and, and they were tightening at a faster rate than everyone else in the world and the U.S. dollar got very, very strong. 
they all got together at the Plaza Hotel in New York and made an agreement that uh, they were all going to start to uh, increase the value of their currencies relative or de basically they were going to start to defend their currencies relative to the strong dollar. So, you know, we're at that point uh, now, the value, I think the UK is the cheapest large country asset in the world and uh, merits and overweight in portfolios at this point. Um, again, this is now turned into a weighing decision. If you're voting, you're caught up in the noise as the question, you know, what's going on there. But when you get perspective and you look back, you think about the weighing machine, um, you know, you got to start weighing this. So we're, uh, we're adding exposure to UK equities uh, and overall to UK ETFs. Um, we like FLBR. Major cities in Canada have extreme vacancy in commercial office space. How much does this hurt REITs and what's going to happen with this unused space? Can you see the commercial real estate sector rebounding? So great question. Um, we launched our private credit fund um, and, and so we invest in some private office REITs and uh, they, they have seen a lot of stress so here's what I did. I went back to the beginning of, of Dream Office REIT. Um, it was Dundee, you know, back in the day and, and looked at that. That's the white line. This is total return, price change since inception. So back 1997, I mean, 25 years, it's lost 35% price-wise from its IPO. Total return 1.63, 163% coming off the distribution for an average total return of 3.9%. Now, obviously, had we took that measurement a few months ago or, or pre-COVID, you know, would have been a better number relative to the TSX at the peak um, in 2019, it was outperforming the TSX, was not quite as good as the S&P 500 or the Russell 3000, which is the entire US stock market. So, you know, since that time, the TSX 7%, US market, well, you know, about 90 basis points higher. Again, measuring for only from the beginning of Dream Office REIT, and you could see that under performance. So the question then is, is it time to take a weighing view or, or not? On, on the office space is, is all the bad news priced in. And so, you know, what's going to happen? I think one of the things we're seeing in some of the funds that we're investing is, is, is it going to rebound? And to some extent, yes, we need less supply coming. So a lot of less new build, you'll see for sure, because there's no demand or not as much demand. What you're going to see in high quality office buildings in North York, I think we've seen this a bit downtown, like we've seen with old warehouse space, it starts to get repurposed into you know, residential living. And so big office tower, retrofit it, make it these big open concept condos, big tall buildings. I, I see a big move in that direction. So there's a lot of opportunity there um, for redevelopment. And I think a lot of the sector will go that way. Does that mean dream office REIT or the entire sector is a buy, you know, right now? And, and I would probably say, no, um, it's still an underweight, but way better than it was a few months ago. Is it time to start weighing it yet? You know, we're, we're getting close, I would think. Should you have a little bit in your portfolio right now? If you're a yield seeker. You know, the return from a low point is, is actually pretty decent looking out a few years. Again, look, look, looking at the charts, you could see other low points. And, you know, what's that return look like, you know, measured out over, over our next few years? And the question then is, is this the low point? The answer is, I don't know. Um, am I overweighting REITs in my portfolio and office REITs in particular right now? The answer is no. How will the damage to Nord Stream pipeline affect the gas price uh, related to Ukraine-Russia conflict? Is this a threat to Europe countries dependent on Russia? 
it, it is. Um, it, it's the the pressure on um, energy prices and natural gas in particular for Europe. Uh, so so this is the European benchmark for natural gas, priced in the same units that Henry Hub is in New York. See this uh, graphic here, um, and you know really when you when you look at the graph here. Um, you can see that seven dollars per BTU for the current contract, you know, relative to something trading at five times that, where the extreme in the U.S. market, this line being when the war broke out, uh, this line being the negative prices uh, that we saw in crude oil uh, at the trough near near COVID and what natural gas was doing at the time, you know, a buck and a half a BTU. Um, so per million BTU, sorry. So, so, and and then you know the recovery of the world reopening, and and of course this this was, um, you know the war. So here's the war, market obviously front run that a little bit in terms of risk, peak, you know higher peak. So is the shutdown going to create a higher peak here? And I I would argue probably not, um, but it could. And so is is a price that is you know, five, six times, seven times what North America pays for gas, uh, a stress for consumers. Absolutely. Liz Truss said they were going to uh, subsidize everybody's home energy bills in the UK. I think EU has said something similar, but that, that's a country thing. It's the European Commission can't, can't govern that but individual countries would, would subsidize and, and get through this very, very difficult period with, with that madman uh, in Russia. And uh, we've got a couple minutes left here before we're out of time. See if I can get through a couple more questions. Prediction for the upcoming election, red wave. Um, you know, what, what Saudi Arabia did today uh, in terms of cutting supply of oil, Washington made a comment they didn't say it was an act of war, but they're not happy about it, uh, as as you could imagine. Um, if oil prices shoot up again uh, over the next month going into the election, sentiment turns turns negative again as people pay more in the pump. And you know what? It's Biden's fault, and I'm just going to vote the other way. So when you look at you know 538.com, a uh, couple links here. The house forecast. So right now, they're they're forecasting based on the recent polls that the house would would swing to the Republicans, uh, but the Senate would would stay, um, you know, Democratic. When you have a split, you have a lame duck presidency for a couple of years. The markets tend to like that um, because the deficits, you know, don't don't increase. And right now, that would be a a big thing and no major spending bills that could hurt the economy but the markets generally like that from a risk premia perspective as it relates to uh, interest rates so interesting question i don't know the answer as we get closer I'll, i'm sure i'll be focusing on that a little bit more every week as, as we get closer to the election but looks like a split at this point um i have not made a bet yet with anybody on the outcome um I, I don't have a real strong view here. The Senate is really, really close. And I haven't done the work yet to dig into, you know, which states matter, uh, what what are those candidates saying? You know, I haven't done that work yet. And, and I will um, in the coming weeks. The market's been very, very volatile. Election really hasn't been an issue or a factor at all compared to everything else going on. And so what else? Final question here then I will take Larry, historically, you've always said interest rates uh, can't, can't go up substantially. COVID has clearly impacted rates. You know, where, where are we gonna be before the end of the year? So I prepared a chart here to have a look at. Let's, let's have a peek. And why I think we're not gonna get, get above 4%, uh, three and a half was big. Um, if you look at and what I call the beginning of the, 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 the next, the, the last bull market, I think it started after the bear market in 1994, as the Fed was tightening. Um, the 10-year U.S. got to a little over eight. Um, 
you know, when when I um, when long bonds were canceled, that that somewhere that this move here from from six down to five that happened in a couple of weeks, that that was the trade that I got caught in. Where you know, looking at the pattern here, I expected us to 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 go up here, um, and it didn't. Anyways, so uh, we can look at a retracement, and we could see that this this level at four. So where did yields bottom? Uh, going into uh, this, if we look at that period, this move here, this was long-term capital management uh, blowing up and the credit crisis that we had coming off a Russian debt default in 97, 98. That's what that move down was. And we, we bottomed at a yield of, of just around, just above 4%. You can see at least four and a quarter here. The 50% retracement of that bull market is four and a quarter. If if it doesn't hold here around four percent, you can see uh, the importance of this level. So great financial crisis before, um, you know, risk off yield started to rally. We got down to the low threes. Where did we bounce to initially? We bounced to a little over four. Every other rally and subsequent bounce couldn't get back above four. You know, now we go into the European crisis, you know, rally back up again, couldn't get above. So four is a really big level for the U.S. 10 year. If it really doesn't hold, the next technical area is above 5%. And I think, well, what has to happen economically for us to get above there? And inflation needs to be way stickier and the Fed needs to make a big mistake. And that's going to be really bad for the economy, put us in a recession and hence you want to own long bonds. So I really like long bonds here for a trade. I've not liked them really for a while here, um, but uh, TLT looks very interesting. Folks, thanks very much for tuning in this week. Final question here, calling me a poor Leaf fan sucker. Go Leafs go. It's going to be a great year, but from a money ball perspective, I, I think they pay way too much for the output. <laughs> Have a great week, everyone.